The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Weiss. The Chessmen of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 17. A Play to the Death. Clear and sweet, a trumpet spoke across the fields of Jitan. From the high tower its cool voice floated across the city of Manator, and above the babble of human discords rising from the crowded mass that filled the seats of the stadium below. It called the players for the first game, and simultaneously there fluttered to the peaks of a thousand staffs on tower and battlement and the great wall of the stadium the rich, gay pennons of the fighting chiefs of Manator. Thus was marked the opening of the Jeddax Games, the most important of the year, and second only to the Grand Decennial Games. Gahan of Gathol watched every play with eagle eye. The match was an unimportant one, being but to settle some petty dispute between two chiefs, and was played with professional Jitan players for points only. No one was killed, and there was but little blood spilled. It lasted about an hour, and was terminated by the chief of the losing side deliberately permitting himself to be outpointed that the game might be called a draw. Again the trumpet sounded, this time announcing the second and last game of the afternoon. While this was not considered an important match, those being reserved for the fourth and fifth days of the games, it promised to afford sufficient excitement, since it was a game to the death. The vital difference between the game played with living men and that in which inanimate pieces are used lies in the fact that while in the latter the mere placing of a piece upon a square occupied by an opponent piece terminates the move. In the former, the two pieces thus brought together engage in a duel for possession of the square. Therefore there enters into the former game not only the strategy of Jitan, but the personal prowess and bravery of each individual piece, so that a knowledge not only of one's own men, but of each player upon the opposing side is of vast value to a chief. In this respect was Gahan handicapped, though the loyalty of his players did much to offset his ignorance of them since they aided him in arranging the board to the best advantage and told him honestly the faults and virtues of each. One thought best in a losing game, another was too slow, another too impetuous, this one had fire and a heart of steel, but lacked endurance. Of the opponents, though, they knew little or nothing, and now as the two sides took their places upon the black and orange squares of the great Jitan board Gahan obtained, for the first time a close view of those who opposed him. The orange chief had not yet entered the field, but his men were all in place. Valdor turned to Gahan. They are all criminals from the pits of Manator, he said. There is no slave among them. We shall not have to fight against a single fellow countryman, and every life we take will be the life of an enemy. It is well, replied Gahan, but where is their chief? and where the two princesses. They are coming now, see, and he pointed across the field to where two women could be seen approaching under guard. As they came nearer, Gahan saw that one was indeed Tara of Helium, but the other he did not recognize, and then they were brought to the center of the field, midway between the two sides, and there waited until the orange chief arrived. Floron voiced an exclamation of surprise when he recognized him. "'By my ancestor, if it is not one of their great chiefs,' he said, and we were told that slaves and criminals were to play for the stake of this game. His words were interrupted by the keeper of the towers, whose duty it was not only to announce the games and the stakes, but to act as referee as well. Of this, the second game of the first day, of the Jeddak's games in the four hundred and thirty-third year of Otar, Jeddak of Manator, the princesses of each side shall be the sole stakes, 
and to the survivors of the winning side shall belong both the princesses, to do with as they shall see fit. The orange princess is the slave woman Lano of Gathol. The black princess is the slave woman Tara, a princess of Helium. The black chief is Ukal of Manataj, a volunteer player. The orange chief is the Dwar Udor of the eighth Utan of the Jeddak of Manator, also a volunteer player. The square shall be contested to the death. Just are the laws of Manator. I have spoken. The initial move was won by Udor, following which the two chiefs escorted their respective princesses to the square each was to occupy. It was the first time Gahan had been alone with Tara since she had been brought to the field. He saw her scrutinizing him closely as he approached to lead her to her place, and wondered if she recognized him, but if she did she gave no sign of it. He could not but remember her last words, I hate you, and her desertion of him when he had been locked in the room beneath the palace by Igos, the taxidermist, and so he did not seek to enlighten her as to his identity. He meant to fight for her, to die for her if necessary, and if he did not die to go on fighting to the end for her love. Gahan of Gathalf was not easily to be discouraged, but he was compelled to admit that his chances of winning the love of Tara of Helium were remote. Already she had repulsed him twice, once as Jed of Gathol and again as Turan the Panthon. Before his love, however, came her safety, and the former must be relegated to the background until the latter had been achieved. Passing among the players already at their stations, the two took their places upon their respective squares. At Tara's left was the black chief, Gahan of Gathol. Directly in front of her, the Princess Panthon, Floron of Gathol, and at her right the Princess Adwar, Valdor of Helium. And each of these knew the part that he was to play, win or lose, as did each of the other black players. As Tara took her place, Valdor bowed low. My sword is at your feet, Tara of Helium, he said. She turned and looked at him, an expression of surprise and incredulity upon her face. Valdor the Dwar, she exclaimed, Valdor of Helium, one of my father's trusted captains. Can it be possible that my eyes speak the truth? It is Valdor, princess, the warrior replied, and here to die for you if need be, as is every wearer of the black upon this field of Jitan today. No, princess, he whispered, that upon this side is no man of Manator, but each and every is an enemy of Manator. She cast a quick meaning glance toward Gahan, but what of him, she whispered, and then she caught her breath quickly in surprise. Shade of the first Jeddak, she exclaimed. I did but just recognize him through his disguise. And you trust him? asked Valdor. I know him not, but he spoke fairly as an honorable warrior and we have taken him at his word. You have made no mistake, replied Tara of Helium. I would trust him with my life, with my soul, and you too may trust him. Happy indeed would have been Gahan of Gathol could he have heard those words. But fate, who is usually unkind to the lover in such matters, ordained it otherwise, and then the game was on. Udor moved his Princess Adwar three squares diagonally to the right, which placed the piece upon the Black Chief's Adwar seventh. The move was indicative of the game that Udor intended playing, a game of blood rather than of science, and evidenced his contempt for his opponents. Gahan followed with his Adwar's Panthon, one square straight forward, a more scientific move, which opened up an avenue for himself through his line of panthons, as well as announcing to the players and spectators that he intended having a hand in the fighting himself, even before the exigencies of the game forced it upon him. The move elicited a ripple of applause from those sections of seats reserved for the common warriors and their women, showing perhaps that Udor was none too popular with these, and, too, it had its effect 
upon the morale of Gahan's pieces. A chief may, and often does, play almost an entire game without leaving his own square, where, mounted upon a thoat, he may overlook the entire field and direct each move. Nor may he be reproached for lack of courage should he elect thus to play the game, since, by the rules, were he to be slain or so badly wounded as to be compelled to withdraw, a game that might otherwise have been won by the science of his play and the prowess of his men would be drawn. To invite personal combat, therefore, denotes confidence in his own swordsmanship and great courage, two attributes that were calculated to fill the black players with hope and valor when evinced by their chief thus early in the game. Udor's next move placed Lano's Adwar upon Tara's Adwar's fourth, within striking distance of the Black Princess. Another move, and the game would be lost to Gahan unless the orange Adwar was overthrown, or Tara moved to a position of safety. But to move his princess now would be to admit his belief in the superiority of the orange. In the three squares allowed him he could not place himself squarely upon the square occupied by the Adwar of Udor's princess. There was only one player upon the black side that might dispute the square with the enemy, and that was the chief's Adwar, who stood upon Gahan's left. Gahan turned upon his thoat and looked at the man. He was a splendid-looking fellow, resplendent in the gorgeous trappings of an Adwar, the five brilliant feathers which denoted his position rising defiantly erect from his thick black hair. In common with every player upon the field, and every spectator in the crowded stands, he knew what was passing in his chief's mind. He dare not speak, the ethics of the game forbade it, but what his lips might not voice, his eyes expressed in martial fire and eloquently. The honor of the black and the safety of our princess are secure with me. Gahan hesitated no longer. Chief's Adwar to Princess Adwar's fourth, he commanded. It was the courageous move of a leader who had taken up the gauntlet thrown down by his opponent. The warrior sprang forward and leaped into the square occupied by Udor's peace. It was the first disputed square of the game. The eyes of the players were fastened upon the contestants. The spectators leaned forward in their seats after the first applause that had greeted the move, and silence fell upon the vast assemblage. If the black went down to defeat, Udor could move his victorious piece on to the square occupied by Tara of Helium, and the game would be over, over in four moves, and lost to Gahan of Gathol. If the orange lost, Udor would have sacrificed one of his most important pieces, and more than lost what advantage the first move might have given him. Physically the two men appeared perfectly matched, and each was fighting for his life, but from the first it was apparent that the black Adwar was the better swordsman, and Gahan knew that he had another and perhaps a greater advantage over his antagonist. The latter was fighting for his life only, without the spur of chivalry or loyalty. The black Adwar had these to strengthen his arm, and besides these the knowledge of the thing that Gahan had whispered into the ears of his players before the game, and so he fought for what is more than life to the man of honor. It was a duel that held those who witnessed it in spellbound silence. The weaving blades gleamed in the brilliant sunlight, ringing to the parries of cut and thrust. The barbaric harness of the duelist lent splendid color to the savage martial scene. The orange Adwar, forced upon the defensive, was fighting madly for his life. The black, with cool and terrible efficiency, was forcing him steadily, step by step, into a corner of the square, a position from which there could be no escape. To abandon the square was to lose it to his opponent and win for himself ignoble and immediate death before the jeering populace. Spurred on by the seeming hopelessness of his plight, the orange Adwar burst into a sudden fury of offense that forced the black back a half a dozen steps, and then the sword of Udor's peace leaped in and drew first blood from the shoulder of his merciless opponent. An ill-smothered cry of encouragement went up from Udor's men, 
the orange Adwar, encouraged by his single success, sought to bear down the black by the rapidity of his attack. There was a moment in which the swords moved with a rapidity that no man's eye might follow, and then the black Adwar made a lightning parody of a vicious thrust, leaned quickly forward into the opening he had effected, and drove his sword through the heart of the orange Adwar, to the hilt he drove it through the body of the orange Adwar. A shout arose from the stands, for wherever may have been the favor of the spectators, none there was who could say that it had not been a pretty fight, or that the better man had not won, and from the black players came a sigh of relief as they relaxed from the tension of the past moments. I shall not weary you with the details of the game. Only the high features of it are necessary to your understanding of the outcome. The fourth move after the victory of the Black Adwar found Gahan upon Udor's fourth. An orange panthon was on the adjoining square diagonally to his right, and the only opposing piece that could engage him other than Udor himself. It had been apparent to both players and spectators for the past two moves that Gahan was moving straight across the field into the enemy's country to seek personal combat with the Orange Chief, that he was staking all upon his belief in the superiority of his swordsmanship, since if the two chiefs engage the outcome decides the game. Udor could move out and engage Gahan, or he could move his Princess Panthon upon the square occupied by Gahan, in the hope that the former would defeat the Black Chief, and thus draw the game which is the outcome if any other than a chief slays the opposing chief, or he could move away and escape, temporarily, the necessity for personal combat, or at least that is evidently what he had in mind as was obvious to all who saw him scanning the board about him, and his disappointment was apparent when he finally discovered that Gahan had so placed himself that there was no square to which Udor could move, that it was not within Gahan's power to reach at his own next move. Udor had placed his own princess four squares east of Gahan when her position had been threatened, and he had hoped to lure the black chief after her and away from Udor, but in that he had failed. He now discovered that he might play his own Adwar into personal combat with Gahan, but he had already lost one Adwar and could ill spare the other. His position was a delicate one since he did not wish to engage Gahan personally, while it appeared that there was little likelihood of his being able to escape. There was just one hope, and that lay in his Princess Panthon, so, without more deliberation, he ordered the piece onto the square occupied by the Black Chief. The sympathies of the spectators were all with Gahan now. If he lost, the game would be declared a draw nor do they think better of drawn games upon Barsoom than do Earthmen. If he won, it would doubtless mean a duel between the two chiefs, a development for which they were all hoping. The game already bade fair to a short one, and it would be an angry crowd should it be decided a draw with only two men slain. There were great, historic games on record, where of the forty pieces on the field when the game opened, only three survived the two princesses and the victorious chief. They blamed Udor, though in fact he was well within his rights in directing his play as he saw fit, nor was a refusal on his part to engage the black chief necessarily an imputation of cowardice. He was a great chief who had conceived the notion to possess the slave Tara. There was no honor that could not accrue to him from engaging in combat with slaves and criminals or an unknown warrior from Manitage, nor was the stake of sufficient import to warrant the risk. But now the duel between Gahan and the Orange Panthon was on, and the decision of the next move was no longer in other hands than theirs. It was the first time that these Manatorians had seen Gahan of Gathol fight, but Tara of Helium knew that he was a master of the sword could he have seen the proud light in her eyes as he crossed blades with the wearer of the orange, he might easily have wondered if they were the same eyes that had flashed fire and hatred at him that time he had covered her lips with mad kisses, in the pits of the palace of Otar. As she watched him 
she could not but compare his swordplay with that of the greatest swordsman of two worlds, her father, John Carter, of Virginia, a prince of Helium, warlord of Barsoom, and she knew that the skill of the black chief suffered little by the comparison. Short, and to the point, was the duel that decided possession of the orange chief's fourth. The spectators had settled themselves for an interesting engagement of at least average duration when they were brought almost standing by a brilliant flash of rapid sword-play that was over ere one could catch his breath. They saw the black chief step quickly back, his point upon the ground, while his opponent, his sword slipping from his fingers, clutched his breast, sank to his knees, and then lunged forward upon his face. And then Gahan of Gathol turned his eyes directly upon Udor of Manator, three squares away. Three squares is a chief's move, three squares in any direction or combination of directions, only provided that he does not cross the same square twice in a given move. The people saw and guessed Gahan's intention. They rose and roared forth their approval as he moved deliberately across the intervening squares toward the orange chief. Otar, in the royal enclosure, sat frowning upon the scene. Otar was angry. He was angry with Udor for having entered this game for possession of a slave, for whom it had been his wish only slaves and criminals should strive. He was angry with the warrior from Manataj for having so far outgeneraled and outfought the men from Manator. He was angry with the populace because of their open hostility toward one who had basked in the sunshine of his favor for long years. Otar, the Jeddak, had not enjoyed the afternoon. Those who surrounded him were equally glum. They, too, scowled upon the field, the players, and the people. Among them was a bent and wrinkled old man who gazed through weak and watery eyes upon the field and the players. As Gahan entered his square, Udor leaped toward him with drawn sword with such fury as might have overborne a less skilled and powerful swordsman. For a minute the fighting was fast and furious, and by comparison reducing to insignificance all that had gone before. Here indeed were two magnificent swordsmen, and here was to be a battle that bade fair to make up for whatever the people felt they had been defrauded of by the shortness of the game. Nor had it continued long before many there were, who would have prophesied that they were witnessing a duel that was to become historic in the annals of Jitan at Manator. Every trick, every subterfuge, known to the art of fence these men employed, time and again each scored a point and brought blood to his opponent's copper hide until both were red with gore, but neither seemed able to administer the coup de grace. From her position upon the opposite side of the field, Tara of Helium watched the long-drawn battle. Always it seemed to her that the black chief fought upon the defensive, or when he assumed to push his opponent he neglected a thousand openings that her practiced eyes beheld. Nor did he seem in real danger nor never did he appear to exert himself to quite the pitch needful for victory. The duel already had been long contested, and the day was drawing to a close. Presently the sudden transition from daylight to darkness which, owing to the tenuity of the air upon Barsoom, occurs almost without the warning twilight of earth would occur. Would the fight never end? Would the game be called a draw after all? What ailed the black chief? Tara wished that she might answer at least the last of these questions, for she was sure that Turan the Panthon, as she knew him, while fighting brilliantly, was not giving of himself all that he might. She could not believe that fear was restraining his hand, but that there was something beside inability to push Udor more fiercely she was confident. What it was, however, she could not guess. Once she saw Gahan glance quickly up toward the sinking sun. In thirty minutes it would be dark, and then she saw, and all those others saw a strange transition steal over the sword-play of the black chief. It was as though he had been playing with the great dwar, Udor, all these hours. 
and now he still played with him, but there was a difference. He played with him terribly as a carnivore plays with its victim in the instant before the kill. The Orange Chief was helpless now in the hands of a swordsman so superior that there could be no comparison, and the people sat in open-mouthed wonder and awe as Gahan of Gathol cut his foe to ribbons and then struck him down with a blow that cleft him to the chin. In twenty minutes the sun would set. But what of that? This is the end of The Chessmen of Mars. Chapter 17 Recording by Tom Weiss